Good, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, or good morning, depending where you're joining us from. Welcome to uh, welcome to the London Data Tribes Discover Net Zero event. Um, hope everyone is having a super day or has had a super day. Um, and as you can see on screen, we are virtual today. So um, yes, looking forward to people joining us from uh, more than just London, um, which is yeah, great to see. You great to see and uh, see you all um yeah if you could uh yeah um yes we do have a few ground rules uh stop pressing the wrong button will um we do have a few ground rules so yeah please uh keep yourself on mute especially if there's any background noise um you know and feel free to use ch the uh, chat for any comments and questions um but first of all yeah we'd love to know where you're from um so let us know where you're joining us from we know we have uh data superstars joining us from you know usually from all around the world so yeah if you could let us know where you're joining from uh, joining us from that would be super awesome um and if you are joining us from london we do want we will ask you to give us a wave uh at some you know uh, shortly so we never know So, Anders, welcome. Thank you for joining us from Denmark. Jan joining us from Netherlands. Michael from Philadelphia. Paul, yes, thank you. Uh, how's Pennsylvania these days? Uh, good afternoon, Pablo. Nice to see you joining us from Spain. Uh, Inez joining us from at, from the end of the galaxy. <laughs> Cool. So we're just going to give a couple of minutes just to make sure uh, everyone get, uh, joins in. Um, yeah, please feel free. Whilst we do ask people to try and be on mute throughout the uh, throughout the event, if you do have a question, you know, uh, please do, and you do want to shout it out, um, then uh, there will be a pro you know, there will be appropriate time for that. Um, otherwise, uh, yes, please put your questions in the chat. Um, fantastic, fantastic. Uh, great, thank you everyone uh, for joining us tonight. Um, really, really, really happy to, uh, you know, really pleased to be able to bring you tonight's event where we're going to be talking about uh, Net Zero Cloud um, and the data, you know, the mega data flow we can get. Uh, we can get with that. Um, for those who don't know uh, who we are, um, I'll just quickly introduce the team. If you don't know us by now already, um, we have Manny, Ines, Matt and myself uh, all on the call tonight, um, ready to answer any questions you may have. Um, just, got, just ran through the introduction to the team. We'll go over a couple of other slides uh, before we get into tonight's session, um, of which part one is going to be brought to you by our very own, our very own Ines Garcia. Um, so, you know, uh, Salesforce MVP, MVP Hall of Famer, is it six years now, five, six years, you're an MVP now, Ines? Cool. Um, and uh, and also uh, follow following in his uh, presentation. Um, we'll have pause for any questions, and then we'll go straight into a presentation from uh, from from another Salesforce MVP Hall of Famer and CTA, um, Mr. Carl Brundage, who's on the call, joining us all the way from uh, joining us from Pennsylvania today. Um, and then following. Following Carl's presentation, um, if we have any questions, yeah, happy to answer those. Uh, we'll try and answer as many as we can um, straight after after that, uh, and then uh, and then we'll move to wrap up. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with the uh, London Data Tribe, we actually have a community success uh, group on Salesforce uh, on the Salesforce site. Um, easiest way to access it. Is just by is just by signing up here at uh, tiny.cc forward slash data tribe. Um, if you do join us, then you know. Um, firstly, all you have to do is send us a quick request. 
uh, once you're granted, uh, well, once your request is uh, granted, you know, we will give you a big announcement uh, and that's your cue to re-log back in, update your profile, stay up to date with what we're doing, uh, have a look at some of the other posts that have been put out there, you know, ask your questions, interact with the community. Um, and yeah, we look forward to, you know, supporting you and engaging with you. Um, in addition to that, uh, we are, you can also find us on YouTube. Uh, we've put the link uh, down in the bottom, but if you just search for Einstein Analytics Data Tribe uh, in the search bar on YouTube, I'm sure you'll come up with our channel. And yes, for those for those of you who like to get a bit uh, bit involved on social media, um, and uh, you know, if you'd like to support us in in making some noise about CRM analytics, then let's make sure we can notify. Yeah, you know, we can. Uh, flag to the, the Trailblazer community team um, by using the following hashtags uh, in any of your tweets or in your LinkedIn posts or any other social media posts um, that you uh, have. Um, and please kindly, if you are, if you do shout about us on Twitter, if you could kindly use our London Data Tribe, at London Data Tribe Twitter handle, we would massively appreciate it. Uh, and if you want to tweet any of us individually, um, uh, Twitter handles are here on the right hand side. Cool. And uh, for anyone who needs links to anything, um, uh, sorry, links to the previous page, um, their links are being kindly put into the chat by my dear colleague as we speak. So um, without further ado, I'd like to hand over the reins to uh, to our wonderful Innes, who's going to talk to us about NetZip by Cloud. Oh, thank you. How about time for me to do a session, content session in the group, isn't it? Um, so yeah, great to be here and great subject, obviously very biased for me that we're going to cover today um, is actually a cloud that comes with tons of CRMA on it. And I thought, well, well let's bring the two things together since more than reasonable. Um, I don't have a question for you lot, and I would love to find out who do we have in the call and especially what drove you to join today. So like, what's the reason that you joined today, CRMA and zero, something in between hanging out with us, all questions are good. I mean, all answers are, are good answers, so. Well, I can go first, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, it's Anna speaking from Denmark. Um, well, I've been looking at the NITS, or what was called Sustainability Cloud for a couple of years ago, because I actually saw that some of it was powered with something else than standard reporting. So that was kind of what intrigued me in the beginning to look at uh, sustainability cloud. And then I've been following it on the site uh, ever since. And to me, it looks like it would be a good place or good cloud to invest some time in uh, alongside with CMA. Uh, so that's why I'm here to, to learn more about this cloud. That's fast, thanks. Um, and also feel free to pop it in the chat. We have, yeah, the aim is the last time uh, online session. So really eager and we are really eager to welcome you. So thank you for joining. Um, and I'll share my screen. Let me see if I can. But yeah, tell us, tell us what drove you here. Like feel free to pop it in the chat. So hopefully we'll bring some clarity to these questions because we don't see this cloud enough. So that's, um, that's my aim of today. All right, and why wouldn't I use CRMA instead of slides? So that's what I'm doing. Ta-da! Okay, so welcome to NetZero Cloud with a little bit of tweaking. Um, for the ones that may not know or was expecting that we're gonna talk about Salesforce and Agile because I'm here. Actually, <laughs> there is some other things about me that you may not know. Um, and one is that I'm also a circular economy professional um, from an executive program with Cambridge University. Um, and we can talk about that if that interests you one day. Um, also, I'm a biomimicry practitioner. Um, and for the ones that may have not heard about biomimicry, really, really simply, 
is to, when we confronted with a challenge, instead of starting from a blank canvas, we look at patterns as strategies that nature has been using and refining for 3.8 billion years of existence. Um, it's a very, very interesting and quite thriving um, area. Also, uh, I wrote a book a couple of years ago, which is about a better way to do business, right? In a way that we are sustainable, we're happy, and yeah, we can also generate profit. And related to the subject today, um, I'm quite involved with the Agile community, not just the Salesforce community. And so launched as a co-chair uh, initiative about sustainability in Agile. So, all these things together and Salesforce and Agile, essentially in a very simple terms, what I do every day is to help organizations, teams, individuals to reduce waste. Waste of time, of finance, but also of efforts, of energy and materials, right? And as we go through the motions, if anything in particular resonates with you, just snap it because I'm super keen to spread the world on the subject at hand. Right? So really trying to help people to move from theoretical agreement that something needs to be done from urgency to agency, right? To a tangible action, which is always the hardest step when you're doing any sort of change management, right? Okay, so looking at the zero cloud, what, what is this cloud, this industry uh, or multi-industry cloud is trying to do? So the context of a sustainability manager, my day to day, is very manual. Um, and what we're trying to move is from this manual, which has a wider margin of error to a much more automated world. So it doesn't diverge much from all the Salesforce work we've done. Another thing that happens is that today the reports um, that you generate, especially around carbon accounting, um, which is the ability for an organization to know what is the footprint related to um, carbon equivalents. And I tell you that in a minute, a bit more. Uh, it's very reactive. Normally you run the reports only one time a year. So by the time you see the results, well, it's very late for you to make any adjustments. So we want to move in a world that is much more proactive, but it's closer to real time. The other thing that this cloud is trying to solve is that is, um, very silo world as a sustainability manager. You are trying to get some um, space and um, input to other departments and teams and uh, across division and a strategy for however, 12, 18, five years. Um, and uh, we want to make it more integrated right? because from this silo, you have to see some of the Excel um, or spreadsheets around how the calculations are done. It, it's very hard. Um, and so, as we know, Salesforce is the technology uh, underneath anyway, so we have open APIs and we can actually integrate and automate a lot of this stuff. Um, and sort of the last thing is that today, Carbon Accounted is not quite yet regulated, but these things are coming down the line. Right? The carbon Accounting, it will become a practice, which is required by law, it will have tax implication and other things. So. Um, one thing I mentioned before is that uh, carbon equivalent. So in the world of trying to understand our footprint uh, to in our biosphere, there is so many different variables and it, it can become quite a daunting thing to account for. So the, the, there is this one metric as a common understanding of a relative measure that we should be working towards to reduce, which are um, carbon uh, equivalents, right? And you will see them um, something like this, T for tons of CO2 equivalents. That's what it is. But essentially, we having bigger problems than just carbon. Um, so we release multiple different gases in excess that the biosphere can uh, sort of work through. And that's carbon dioxide, that is methane, that's nitrate oxide, that's fluorinated gases, right? Think um, that, for example, one ton of methane has the same warming effect that about 80 tons of uh, carbon dioxide. So 
with carbon equivalence, what you do is normalize it uh, so you can work through it in a simpler way to digest. Like you will see your PNL at the end of the year, and then you will see how much profit and loss you do. So similarly, the equivalence helps us to do something like that. Now, flying through uh, because of time, really, but um, the regulations are happening, right? So um, pointed here, some of the regulations already in place, so about to close from the site to uh, CSRD to ESG disclosures and many more. And as you can see, certain uh, countries are definitely um, there closer than others, but probably by the time we finish today, there is a new policy coming through. Majority of the regulations to date are around uh, either financial institutions or um, listed in the stock market uh, in exchange. So those are sort of targeted first uh, to start accounting for their footprint, either uh, carbon accounted, but also for example, here in the UK, there is um, a particular, if you are listed and you have more than 500 employees, you report also on climate related risk and opportunities uh, related to energy as well, but very keen on energy at the moment. Anyway, so this is a little bit of a flavor of why this thing exists. Um, now, if we go into the details, what I wanted to sort of back it together is what makes net zero cloud different from other clouds we might have worked in our Salesforce world. And I sort of back it this in three groups. One, which I think is pretty um, different is that Salesforce is creating you data. This doesn't happen. Uh, often. Salesforce creates your data. And which data that Salesforce creates? So let's have a look. Um, part of the setup or continuous maintenance of the system would be either loading or updating reference data. And what is the reference data? Is data that comes from external uh, entities that's going to help you with the calculations of your carbon equivalent. Right? And as you can see, there are a bunch of things here from energy intensity, things related to uh, waste or whatever, uh, air travel, electricity, and so on, right? So we can see that you have multiple cells, sources, multiple data sets that comes from um, different environmental agencies. Um, and these data sets don't, doesn't get um, updated very often. Um, and whenever Salesforce makes it available, you can see here that you, you have a new version and you can update. The reason why those things doesn't get often is because these um, agencies, well, they put it out there whenever it's available. Now, and because of that reason, you have the data set of inflation rates because 20 pounds, 20 euros, dollars, whatever today, they don't do the same than five years ago, 10 years ago. So inflation rates, it's helped you to calculate that difference, especially when you're calculating on expenses. Uh, what else? Yeah, so basically this reference data uh, creates from the back of it factor sets. And if we just look at one, this is electricity related. We can see that these, those are records in Salesforce, we know this. Um, these are coming from this particular agency. So you have a link to the reference data and it's sitting in other emission factor sets. In this particular one, we're looking at stationary fuel conversion. Um, so stationary are things that don't move. So think about um, a building, for example. Um, and then also we'll say in the zero cloud, you also have vehicles, so things that do move. Yeah. A simple way to think about that. Now, this is one of the buckets. Why is different? Salesforce creates your data. Another thing that is different is that you have a lot of quirky automations. One of which, let's have a look, um, is the building energy intensity because not all the buildings consume the same amount or intensity of uh, energy. Therefore, their footprint it will vary. And as part of the process, you have the ability to set up that building energy intensity. Now, um, from the data, the reference data, if you are based in the US, you have the CVECS, which is a bunch of data sets that will help you to calculate your building intensity fairly easily. If you are not in the US, which some of you, uh, some of us, we are not, 
And don't worry, if you have enough data in the system, you can run what's it called uh, the building energy intensity builder. And very simple UI basically is asking you the name of the building, um, start and end date uh, size, because depends on the size, it will consume differently. And also the type of building, because every building is very different. The energy that a data center requires, for example, from cooling um, to maybe an office or something like that. So all of this will help you to calculate the intensity of your building. And then you have all the other part of the uh, calculations I'm not even mentioning. That is that translation between the reference data and into your inputs and how many carbon equivalents they are. But another interesting part of the net zero cloud is this data processing engine. Um, and I believe it comes from the, uh, the consumer goods um, cloud. So reusing some of these modular components from other places. And as part of the setup, what you do is sort of um, copy of the, uh, to have a uh, unmanaged sort of version of it. And you have the ability to either calculate forecast from your emissions, so initialize or recalculate and stuff like that. Um, this essentially translates to um, this pretty view, which as a sustainability manager comes really handy. You can look at how are we doing and how it looks we're going to be doing over the next 10 years. So you can adjust the timeline, right? Your target emissions, the actual emissions, um, also the carbon credits, if that's part of your temporary patch strategy. And I will highly encourage you not to base all your net zero efforts towards carbon credits. Um, and also your revenue and how the things impact. So you can edit certain things over here. Uh, what else? Yes, uh, another thing that makes Net Zero Cloud different is that normally we have industry clouds. Now I like to argue that this is a multi-industry cloud. There is, this is a really big world. This is not just carbon accounting. You have a lot of other things around here. Now, for example, um, circular economy, you have all the module around waste. So for example, here we are looking at a waste footprint. So a foot, the concept of footprint in, in this cloud is um, a, an asset and a timeline, right? So in this case, we are looking this tower, this building, a stationary asset, so something that doesn't move and during a calendar year, 2021. But essentially you could be using the footprints quarterly, monthly, however you want. Um, and what it does, well, it gives you the ability to account for the waste that you generate. So we, why this matters is because um, a forest, <laughs> a forest behaves and have about 2% of waste. In comparison, how we organize ecosystem, our cities, we are much closer to 80% of waste. So having the ability to account for the things that you're not using, it gives you the opportunity to see and find opportunities to use them, reuse them, or avoid the waste coming through the pipeline in the first place. So you have this waste um, sort of record that you can see how you're gonna dispose um, the item and which kind of item it is. So that will also have its weight into your footprint overall. Um, but you have many more things. So even thinking about waste, if you think about the whole value change where things come from for you to be able to create your um, offering and how it gets utilized. So you have a very long supply chain um, or value chain that you can optimize. So I argue that also you could be enhancing this cloud to your procurement. So you have all the supplier module that gives you the ability to say, um, to account for which suppliers are you using? How much are you using? What is the, um, their intensity? Because you may use a lot of money or invest a lot of money with this particular supplier, but they much be much more linear in terms of their footprint in comparison to another one. 
Um, so it helps you to make procurement decisions of how you're going to run your business uh, because you should be accounting across your value chain. And it's net zero cloud, so you have tons of analytics I don't have time to go through. Um, for example, like the ones that we're seeing here um, across different suppliers and so on. Um, as you know, you can just, everything is dynamic. It will update as you work through it. So super useful and so much nicer, again, that what is the regular life of a sustainability manager. So people get very excited with these things because that's not their normal reality. Um, and then you also have the module of um, diversity, equality, and, and inclusion. You have the uh, governance and disclosure. There's a lot of stuff in here. Um, now, when we are looking at um, carbon accounting, uh, back in the days, um, the greenhouse protocol was sort of like the protocol that came about for people to try to work out in their head where the priorities were and really gave you a framework as an organization to start tackling your footprint and reduce consumption. That's essentially what we're trying to do. Now, with best intention, um, for some reason, the scopes of footprint have been named scope one, two, and three, right? And because of semantics, once you put or numbers on things, it feels like you need to order those things, right? And I'm being very specific and controversial with this because what's happened is that um, there is this um, assumption that you should start working on your scope one, then you look at your scope two, and you look at your scope three. But I probably, um, there is uh, most of us in this call gonna be in, in either digital and services. So most of our scope is probably scope three. And just to show you, what are these three scopes? Scope one right, is direct scopes. And I th think of them with a B. So scope one is what you burn, what you burn directly in your facility. Scope two is what you buy, for example, your energy supplier. Um, and scope three is your beyond, is the dangerous miscellaneous bucket, so the dangerous other pick list, right? This is what it is, where you have 15 different categories with a lot of stuff from employee commute to business travel, like there is a lot. And in this day and age, a lot of our scopes are sitting in three. Um, and again, when we were looking at the value chain, um, think about upstream activities, all the things that you get to, to be able to create that offering and then downstream activities on the things that happens after the fact. And how we build our applications and which devices are used also matters. Um, now for Net Zero Cloud to work out, where does a bucket what? Um, there is a magic checkbox. So we go to a footprint of a building, for example. So this is the carbon footprint for a building. So this building, stationary asset for the calendar year of 21. If we go to the building itself, there is this magic checklist, uh, checkbox. It doesn't look like much. Yeah. Is it asking you, is it own? And this makes the decision for you where the thing's gonna sit you, the scope one or two. Depends of what is the uh, emission. Um, the energy usage. Um, you have the ability to override these things if you want to, uh, but yeah, so just, you know, that this field does matter and quite a bit. Um, another thing I wanted to go through is energy uses. So yeah, so we've seen that we have the uh, reference data and then we've seen that we have certain assets. So either a vehicle, maybe I own different cars uh, to provide, I don't know, packaging services or something. Um, how do we connect the two is through energy uses. And as you can see, there are multiple different objects as an entity that's gonna help you to do that link. So air travel, your, we talked about buildings, but freight hauling, um, ground travel, hotel stay, rental, blah, blah, blah. Right? So that energy use does matter. Um, and then last but not least, um, I wanted to touch on procurement. So on things, 
that you get outsourced. So if we look at a summary of procurement, it's just a placeholder really, uh, you can see here items. So every expense that you have should be really living here. Okay? Investments, uh, capital goods, or the purchase service and stuff like that. Okay? And these things, right? We can automate. It doesn't have to. You could. You could. I mean, there are different ways to look at it. But if you, what you have is expenses uh, as a pound or dollar time into items, you can automate these things and relieve a lot of the pressure into how the things get calculated over. Um, now, a small diversion is that so far we are looking a lot around uh, carbon related, but the very systems that, su that support our life on earth are more than just carbon related, right? Our problems, so our opportunities, our regeneration needs to be beyond carbon. So we have, I saw this uh, image and I thought it was quite good visual where there are many other things that we should also try to tap into as we want to become better at what we do. And that's from the biodiversity, um, air pollutants or the overconsumption, unless we tackle overconsumption, inequality and so on. Uh, so if you haven't looked yet, you have the uh, sustainable development goals from the UN, I will highly recommend to look at them. Okay. So in essence, the architecture, this I'm going to try to summarize it. Um, the architecture of net zero cloud, mega simplified is three things. You have your sources, your buildings, your vehicles, whatever. You have the usage that you do on those assets, and then you have your factors, so you can do the conversion for you. Now, remember. I'm going to show you the diagram of high-level architecture from Salesforce. Okay, don't panic, don't panic. I have a better version. But this is the actual architecture and you see there are certain interesting things like inflation rates down here is living by itself. Um, but um, yeah, remember the colors, orange emission sources, green energy uses, emission factors is purple. So there you go. So this was the previous diagram, which I, I do so much prefer, sorry. Um, so if we look at the middle down here, we have our energy sources. So a stationary vehicle and scope three energy, energy sources. We have our purple here, which are all the factor sets that we have been looking at. Again, air travel or procurement related waste, da, da, da. And then we have our energy uses down here, hotel stay, blah, blah, blah. blah. So we kind of touch these things. Again, carbon footprint in essence is the ability for you to say this particular source in this particular period of time aggregate all the footprints, the scopes, one, two, three. Um, and because you, you could have multiple different buildings or subsidiaries and stuff like that, you also have the concept, wherever is it gone, of um, annual emissions, right? So at the end of the year, you could just summarize everything across multiple carbon footprints into one. So you know your total as an organization. Now, this is mostly what we covered today. Um, again, there is the supplier module that it deserves its own time. Probably you even can create uh, a portal for your suppliers for them to provide you their footprint, which it will be much more accurate than the calculations you will do based on expense. And um, you have all the section about in water waste or the other waste. And again, disclosure, social governance, um, the target, <coughs> if you focus on uh, emission reduction as a um, science-based targets, you have all that. And then uh, carbon credits, which I don't like to focus too much, but you have the ability to get carbon credits 
perhaps from Salesforce, they have their own marketplace, and then you can allocate the different projects and credits into um, topping up what you haven't managed to reduce. Okay? Again, Carbo Credits is a short-term plan. It's a patch. We shouldn't be focusing on carbon credits. We need to tackle consumption. Okay. Um, yes, and yeah, essentially, again, I think Carl will take us through some of the lovely analytics that we have over here. Um, but yeah, you, you can see some basic sort of uh, trending lines across your different scopes and in total of your scopes. So you know if you, you're going in the right direction or not, um, and so on. So I won't go through that too much looking at time. So just to wrap up um, from me, Yes, talk to me about Salesforce, talk to me about Agile, talk to me about carbon accounting, circular economy, biomimicry, sustainability, permaculture, climate coaching is something I started doing recently. So there you go, easy way, I think, to get hold of me. Otherwise, there are many other channels and means. Um, as a Salesforceian, we also need to account for how we build carbon efficient applications, right? How we design them to consume as little as possible. Which energy source is there? And what happens with the end user of our products? Uh, not just the finished product itself, like, oh, we have all this feature, but which machines are they using? Um, and how many steps and things they need to do? Uh, it matters. So. I'm going to leave you with this thought uh, stop. This is home. Beautiful. We must deeply understand that this is home. All our conceptual inventions that doesn't support this home to thrive as a whole are flawed. There are no boundaries. We all breathe the same air. This is our home, which is not ours alone. Awesome. Ines, thank you very much indeed. That you know, I am always, uh, I never fail to be fascinated by your endless enthusiasm. And uh, I do ever wonder if there is any limit to your expertise. So thank you very much. Um, just wanted to check and see if we've got any questions in the chat. Um, it looks like we're good. So um, a big thank you there from Yuri. Thank you, Yuri. Um, if if you do have, if it takes you a couple of minutes to, or a few minutes to think of some questions, then, um, you know, please do pop, pop them in the chat. Um, otherwise we'll go, yeah, otherwise we will uh, pop in to see Carl. So give me a second. I go through the formalities of introducing to everyone to Carl Brundage. If you, you don't know Carl, Carl is one of uh, the world's few certified technical architects, uh, and he is also MVP Hall of Famer. Um, he has uh, participated with the David Tribe in previous events, um, and I believe he's going to be talking to us about how we can use the uh, you know the amount of data generated in. Uh, net zero cloud um with that uh carl over to you thanks will and just to keep me honest here what uh from a timeline perspective what time do i have till uh we have a good sort of well according to the agenda we would say we have 27 minutes 26 okay. minutes perfect i will make sure i'm on time <laughs> Thank you. So it's a pleasure to be here to, to speak with you about Net Zero Cloud. Uh, I think coming in, I definitely didn't have as much depth or expertise as Innis on, on Net Zero Cloud. So it took a while for me to understand some of the concepts that she pre you know presented when when I first really started exploring uh, exploring the object model and, and how it worked. And and what really helped me to think about was, you know, at at the core, right, a stationary asset you think about as a building. And then you're going to have things like a monthly power bill or a monthly gas bill 
for that building that you're going to start recording. And because you're buying power you're using gas, that has a certain amount of carbon associated with it. So that becomes your, your energy use and then your carbon footprint. And those are the things that if you think about, okay, I can do that for one building. But what if I have 10 buildings? What if I have 100 buildings? What if I have thousands of buildings? I'm a very big company. Well, there's all this data that needs to come in from external sources that you have to collect. If you think about vehicle assets, people are driving, they're filling up with gasoline, they're filling up with diesel, maybe they're using an electric car. You need to collect all this other information as well, too. So then it becomes, well, how do we go ahead and, and see that? How do we make sense of it? And I think that's where the analytics comes in. So if we look at what comes with net zero from an analytics perspective, the place we're going to start is with a app. And this app has the normal type of questions that you might see when you pick it. Uh, you are going to see the different dashboards that are associated with it. All of the crazy objects that uh, don't make sense at first, but then as you start working more and more with Net Zero Cloud, you see the pattern that's there, and as well as some of the example visualizations. The nice thing, or maybe not nice, depending upon what you're expecting, when it comes to personalizing this, you only have three questions that you have to answer. You think about the reporting year that you want to look at, the comparison year, and then how you want to secure the data by a real hierarchy or none at all. And what that'll do is it'll create a app for you that has a couple of things in it. It has a whole lot of dashboards, which we won't probably look at every single one in detail today, but we will focus on some of the important ones. It creates a series of data sets that populate that. Some of them are the reference data that we looked at in, in the first part of the session. Some of them are based off of the data that you populated it. And then, although it says data flows, it actually gives us two data recipes. So there's no data flows associated now. Everything is in a recipe. There are some unique or different things in these two recipes. So this is part one, which is focused on a lot of the energy usage and supplier information. And then part two, which is uh, really focused on, on carbon credits and allocations. But there's some things in there that maybe you haven't seen before or uh, look a little bit unique that if you're going to step in and start customizing, you definitely need to be aware of what's going on. So if there's questions as I go along, you know, drop them in chat. Feel free to, to interject. Will, if you see those come in, happy to answer questions as we go along. The place I'm going to start, I'm going to go back to, and look at some of the dashboards. and. Not really going to go through these in alphabetical order, but I'm going to think about kind of logically how, how does a customer or a user start viewing their data or think about. And the one that is, is a good starting point is the audit dashboard. Because if you think about it, uh, you're collecting all kinds of different information from a lot of different sources. Yes, you can manually enter electric bills or mileage on a car or fuel slips, but more likely than not, you're going to have some type of data feed whether it is a data upload or an actual integration, there's a lot of data flowing in and out of your system. How do you know that you have everything? How do you know that you didn't miss something or something got mistyped or the bill was late for a month? Uh, the local power company near us had a month where they totally messed up bills and overcharged people. So those things do happen and you may have some corrections. So that audit dashboard, that's designed to give you that view to say, are our, our data accurate? Do we have the right emissions information in there? Are things effective? So if we look at this dashboard, you know, it's going to tell you some things around your assets. Are you using commercial buildings, data centers, vehicles? What are those uh, different sources that are there? And a look over time, which is very helpful to start seeing and saying, okay, we know something dropped off dramatically in 2022 or here, you know, I have no 2023 data. What's going on? It's a way where you can monitor and, and start looking into where do you need to find something wrong from a data perspective. It'll give you a level deeper of detail as well, too, where you can look at things like your different assets, how they're emitting gases from year to year, what's using electricity, what's your breakdown between renewable and non-renewable, and then even uh, different types of, of fuel. Uh, and you may say, well, why are commercial buildings on here? Well, if you think about it, if you're running a data center, maybe you have a backup generator that needs fuel. Maybe you are heating a building that uses fuel. So you kind of can, can think of things between stationary and the vehicle assets of, of sharing different pieces of information.
Uh, likewise, there's a lot of places in net zero where we will do what most of the world does is use, use liters or take the US specific view and toss gallons in there. So you can enter things in your preferred units, there's conversion factors, and then you can look at things summarized in the way that you like. We looked at uh, the different emission factors and how you can load in the reference data, something that you don't have to maintain on your own, pretty easy to update. If you wanna understand what's going on from a detailed perspective, you can look at the data audit dashboard. Same thing from a data quality perspective, you can go in and see you know, where are there outliers, where are there things where something is lower than what you've seen in the past or higher, and then take action on it from there. And not to, you know, sell you short on renewable energy, there's a way to look at that as well, too. So you can look at your progress over time and see how you're trending if you're using more renewable sources or less. If we go in and we edit this dashboard, I'm going to I'm going to jump down to the data set section. Yes, I'll show you some JSON, but for me, you know, carbon footprint, the emissions, so one of our reference data, and then taking a look at this, the carbon footprint item. So those are the things that go into this dashboard. Once you're kind of satisfied and saying, okay, I think this is a good picture of what my, my data is that's coming in. I think it's accurate. Now let's start taking a look at how we're doing. I think the, the best place for that is the climate action dashboard that is previewed, but this is a good place to, to look in. Uh, one of the things for my dashboard here, I'm gonna just change to all time because I don't have any current year data yet. But what it lets you do is it lets you see how you're doing at a particular time period. You can see what you've admitted, the different breakdowns between scopes. But what's important is these aren't just numbers. You know, if I give you a number like 26.5K, is that good? Is that bad? Well, you want to see what it's relative to. So if we compare that to a previous year, we can see that we're significantly higher than those previous years. So we're probably not trending in a positive fashion. But this is also a common place where customers will look to customize the dashboard because the absolute numbers are interesting, but they don't always reflect the underlying business activity. Are your emissions up or down because you've taken action? Or has your business changed? Are your emissions up because you bought another company that's the same size and now you're twice the size? So yes, you're gonna emit more or are your emissions down because you're doing less business? If you think about a construction company, maybe you're, you're building fewer sites this year so you're not running equipment as much. That doesn't mean that you've done a good job from a sustainability perspective, it just means your business is less. So oftentimes this dashboard is customized to take a look at emissions per square foot of office space or emissions per uh, diesel, you know, gallons of diesel or gallons of gasoline, or if you're off-road hours, engine hours, how long you've run an off-road vehicle in order to build something. The other thing that comes into play when you start customizing like that is um, you don't always look at tons of, of carbon equivalency in comparison to, you know, one square foot or because what it ends up giving you is it ends up giving you a lot of decimals, right? Like 0 0.002 tons. People have a hard time conceptualizing that. So a lot of times you'll end up factoring it and saying per 10,000 square foot of office space so that you get something like one ton of carbon, which is easier for somebody to see the change from one place to another. If we look a little bit further down the, in the dashboard, uh, you're going to get the breakdown of emissions across the, the, the world, uh, across different business types, and then some predictive capability. So this is using the time series inside of Einstein Analytics. What is probably important to know here is there, there, I have seen two different license types for net zero in the wild. There is the net zero base three apps or base five apps. And then there's the CRM analytics for net zero cloud. If you have the base three or base five, one thing that's different about the time series, time series will only give you one period of prediction. So if we're in 2023, it would only give you prediction for 2024. Or if you're looking at quarters, it'll only give you the next quarter. So if you're you need that CRM analytics for net zero cloud license to have this full 10 year type prediction that's out there. So if you see some differences in there, go and look at the license type or the license that's assigned to your user, because that will definitely impact what you can see in some of these dashboards. 
down below, uh, you'll see kind of that, that bubble chart, which draws your attention to where there are large contributing cities. So the locations in the world versus the emissions. And then down below, how things have trended from a total emissions perspective or travel and vehicle, as well as by assets. So this kind of gives you that first part of, well, how do I take action? You know, it's great that uh, this is the number, but what, what's contributing to it? You know, if I'm looking here, then I'm probably not going to worry so much about these smaller emissions, but some of the, the office space, you know, what can I do from a sustainability perspective to improve what we're doing in, in the office? And likewise, you know, locations, because uh, if you if you don't think about the actional side of it, it's hard to change those numbers. That's where I do like the the time series, maybe not 10 years where it says we're going to do really, really bad. But the idea of this is what you think is going to happen so you can see where your activity has led to it. And I've seen a lot of customers that are thinking that way of, OK, if uh, I've done three tons each month and, and now I'm starting to go down, you know, that's the effect of switching from uh, from on-road vehicles that have gas or diesel to more of an electric mix and, and how that's going to impact us and what it's going to look like at the end of the year. So that part of it is pretty important. The other thing that's here, uh, we can take that view and look at it from uh, an emissions perspective from, from going forward seeing things like the overall emissions scope wise. So the breakdown between the different types and then the activity that leads to it as well. The other, oh, and sorry, from a dashboard or data set perspective, this one is being driven a lot by the energy use data set. Uh, that's one of the things that comes into play that we use for a lot of these pieces. If we look at the other dashboards that are out here, uh, not that they're not important, you can definitely get a net zero trial app. That's what I'm in today and take a look at these yourself. But they're focused on those different topical areas of the data model that Ines talked about, the, the business travel, carbon credits, looking at suppliers or waste or water management, being able to drive in and, and see those particular different items. So with about 15 minutes remaining, let's go take a look at these crazy data recipes that make up the data sets. I'm gonna focus um, more on part one, because this is where I have spent a lot of time when, when it comes to, to talking to, to different folks about it. The carbon credits is interesting, but this one is, if you understand this one, you're, you're definitely in good shape. If we think about the energy uses, uh, each of the objects in Salesforce is brought in, the stationary vehicle, hotels, and so forth. So this is nothing more than a, you know, pulling that object from Salesforce. Uh, but what maybe is unique is the way that the data gets together to make a consolidated data set in analytics, which is the use of a pen. And I, I don't always use a pen. Uh, a lot of times I'm joining things together, but this is where it's going to say, all right, if we look across all your different types of assets, how do, we, how do we put that data together? So if I go into this first append, this is going to take and bring your buildings together with your vehicles. And okay, that makes sense to me. There's, there's some things that, that I can see. The, the, the record goes together from an ID perspective. The name goes together. It's a different type of, of footprint. But then you get into some places where uh, you have things in the building that don't exist in the vehicle. Things like, well, what's electricity used in that particular market or location? So if you think about electric, electric is different in the Northeast portion of the United States versus the Southwest. And it's a different mix. There's more hydroelectric in the Southwest because the Colorado River is dammed and that, um, that is a renewable source. So there's less emissions than using coal plants in the Northeast. So that's where these things come in and apply to the stationary assets, but they don't apply to the vehicles. So for the vehicles, you have to add some things that don't correspond to the first piece. So things like the cost center. So what business has this vehicle? How, how far is it traveling? So it's traveling in miles or it's traveling in kilometers. So as you go through this, you end up with I'll call it a ragged data set where there's some things that are common, but then there's a lot of things that are different. 
So if you think back to my dashboard before where you wanted to take climate action and you wanted to make it unique per business entity, you have to go in each of these appends and pull in any custom fields that you've added. So if you added on your vehicles, the amount of engine hours that's used in an off-road diesel vehicle, well, you have to remember to build it into that append somewhere. So it's not just kind of a normal, hey, I add it to the object, I add it to the data sync, it flows through my joints. You have some actions with all these appends in order to put that in. So that's what these all go through. And you end up with a set of all the different sources together. Uh, but what the last one does is now we say, all right, we have the energy used. What's the emission source? And the emission source is going to come down here and it's going to do the same thing on the actual vehicle itself, the actual asset itself, the scope three, the country. So the idea is you see this pattern used repeatedly inside of the data recipe. The next thing that's probably interesting to look at in the data recipe that's a, a little bit different or maybe not something you would necessarily implement yourself is if we look at the transform. One of the things going on with the transform is to figure out how all these different things that are appended together kind of have meaning. It, it does formulas where it's looking at the IDs and it's looking at the starts with is, you know, if it has these first three characters in the ID, then it's stationary or vehicle or air travel or freight. Um, if I were building this from scratch, would I do it this way? Probably not. You know, I would probably put transforms up front. I would put transforms right off my objects and say, this is a stationary type. This is a freight hauling. This is, you know, whatever it is. And then having that flow through, because there's some places where you're seeing similar types of transforms or similar calculations in multiple places. And you really want to keep those in one place. Because if I go down here, you know, look, there, it's going to look at the asset configuration and see what happened and figure out, oh, it's a commercial building because that's what's in this particular pick list or it's fleet vehicles and private jets. So again, as you add configuration on the Salesforce side, it's not going to automatically flow into this data recipe. You're going to be like, oh, well, what happened to my, you know, my, my locomotives, my train freighting, my train hauling? Well, you got to come in and find the place in the recipe where it's categorized this way and, and add it into that object or add it into a different object. So that's kind of a, a, a lesson to learn or, or something to catch before it, it happens. Otherwise, you're going to be going through a lot of these and saying, oh, my, my data doesn't show up. Uh, a lot of relabeling in here. Uh, some things where, you know, I, I like this one only because I'm in the U.S., but there's a place where it says, you know, is U.S. true? You know, see, so we have our, our own custom you know, U.S. pick list that, that doesn't necessarily help in, in other places. But those are the types of things that you're going to have to come in and add a, a lot of your own customizations to. Uh, for other than that, you know, the most of the rest of it is just joining into the other sources. And then you have your energy use data set. And that's the, the data set that drives that climate action dashboard that you can use to say, this, this is what we've done. So we can see, okay, this was what a asset used. So Cirrus Tower in January to March. So for one quarter, the diesel usage eventually was over here. So 500. Again, you, the, a lot of the things don't have units until you look at what the unit piece was. And then using the factors that are loaded somewhere else, it'll do the calculations and say, this is what your tons of uh, carbon equivalency were for that particular scope one. This one doesn't have scope two because it's stationary. And then you can use that to build your own analytics off of from, from there. If we go a little bit lower in the data flows, uh, what you're gonna see is really just the, the same type of approach for each entity or, or each kind of concept by itself. The emission source, again, there's there's a lot more of these things in here, you know, where we're looking at pick list values and deriving things. So uh, again, another starts with all these things. Again, if you, if you make a change in one place, you're gonna have to come in and kind of track through it to make sure that it ends up in your final data set. Same thing with the carbon footprint. Um, you know, there's not a lot of what I'll call crazy calculations. 
I've done some things for customers where they may have uh, surveys or, or questions and people don't have to answer every question and they always want the latest answer no matter which survey it was, even if the survey was five surveys ago. Some of those things have really complicated logic. Most of this is really tagging things the right way and combining the, the, the different pieces that are appended together to come up with it. Uh, stationary footprint, submission sets, scope three, same thing. Uh, so this one will give you uh, quite a few of the different data sets that you need if we think about it. Uh, I think this one has one, two, three, four, five, six, six of the, the data sets. And then part two, which we, we're not going to go through this one in detail, know that it's very, very similar. Uh, this gives you sustainability credits and the carbon credits. Uh, the main thing to highlight there is there is an aggregation, which you don't always see in your data sets, but the idea of being able to take things together and say, this is what the total is, and then use it back from uh, a final data set perspective. So let me pause there and see if there's questions on either the dashboards, the data sets, or the data flows that were associated. Thank you, Carl. Um, yes, we did have uh, a I guess more more a bit of an inquiry as well as a question from Anders saying that uh, even though a lot of the even though this uh, being out of the box, there's still a lot of potential customization <laughs> and both in terms of recipes and dashboards. Um, is that you know, is that correct? So I think yeah. it is. I, I think I think it's a good starting point. Uh, much like anything in Salesforce, you know, how many people take sales for, Sales Cloud and just use it without customizing it? Like almost none, right? So it's the same idea here. It's it's a good platform. It's a good starting point to give you insights, uh, to, to collect some of the standard factors in one place that you don't have to gather. But then the way that you're running your sustainability program in a, in a company is going to be, is going to differ. And you're going to want things that are unique to you. You're going to want to go back to the businesses and say, oh, you know what, this is how your activity or your choices lead to our, our carbon. If we make different choices, if, if we can get to 50% electric vehicles instead of 10%, this is the impact you're going to have. And that's where the out-of-the-box dashboards, to me, don't quite get you there. It doesn't help you facilitate the, the actions or the change that you want, but by customizing it to your particular business, that's where then you can make better decisions and have better discussions internally. And then feel free to jump in if there's things you want to add during any of this. Okay. Thank you, Carl. Um, so without wanting to sort of open up too much, you know, the entire world or or anything like that, but I'm guessing um, from some of the comments I've seen today, yeah, is, is it, you know, if someone is sort of, uh, you know, implementing, you know, uh, you know, Take, taking uh, here, you know, CRMA out of the box at this point. Are there any sort of particular immediate sort of do's and don'ts that that people should should consider uh, to get started? I mean, appreciating that mm -hmm. you know whatever you know, it just like. Yeah, just like you you mentioned impl implementing sales cloud for example you know ev everything is going to be tailored and unique to each different company but uh, if, you know, if there's anything that was you know if there's any sort of top tips that you could potentially yeah i definitely think there's some points for for consideration and and they they may not even just be specific to net zero cloud some of them are but they're, they're good for any of the analytics is you know, what personas do you think are going to access this? Is this a solution that our sustainability team or sustainability leads going to use? Or are we open it up to other business leaders? Are there any reports or analytics or, or key performance indicators that we're tracking before we come to Salesforce? So yes, you could end up a company that's never done anything and Salesforce is brand new, but more often than not, there's existing sustainability initiatives and there's things that are being measured and reported on and being done that you're going to want to replicate and you're going to want to have customized from it. Uh, you, you saw all the out-of-the-box dashboards or all the features of Net Zero Cloud. You may not be tracking water. You may not be tracking waste. Um, you may not be tracking suppliers right now. So what are the things you want to keep? What are the things you want to turn off to make it simpler and easier to adopt today and then add those things as you progress? Um, what customizations are you putting in Salesforce? What new fields that you need to carry, carry forward? And then really going through and, and thinking about the data, uh, 
who who needs access to the data is the role hierarchy sufficient is there other things you need to do you know those are kind of the 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 things i ask when you were to start a project like a, a net zero implementation to to kind of customize what's out of the box before you get into like really really deep customizations Thank you, Carl. Some advice there for anyone, uh, anyone at the start of their journey with um, net zero cloud and zero analytics. Thank you. Um, no further questions have come up, so um, okay, we'll give a shout if something does. Perfect. Hopefully, I'm on time too. Yeah, all good. Excellent. Yeah, and probably I'll also ask. What's the legacy data that they have? What's the volume of it and how it looks like? Because as you can see with the million different objects, it's going to be fiddly if you have to do any migration. Um, that will be one more I probably add. Uh, and the state of it, again, it, it doesn't differ to other uh, source code implementations, but because you have so many objects, then you know you sort of start from the bottom up. And, and it's a little weird. I mean, let's be honest. At first, wrapping your head around that object model, it's like, what? what? Carbon, what? Energy here? Where does this go? So your data probably isn't quite structured like that. So it, there is that work to get to get things populated. And, you know, you take the approach of, you know, get get last year's or get this year's loaded and then go back and back populate. And you're going to, you're going to find gaps and you're going to find holes and you're going to look at dashboards and be like, Oh, we missed three quarters worth of data somewhere that, that, that brings those things to light by using CRM analytics, which, which is good for your overall effort, but can create a much longer project or, or more work than you think you had when you first went in to, to get started and, you know, click the few, few questions on the analytics app and think you know, you're done. Well, not, not quite. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Um, yeah, we're getting a, a lot of comments in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, uh, everyone, for the presentations um, and very positive feedback. So uh, thank you to everyone. Um, thank you to everyone for your comments. Um, if there are any questions, um, you know, people, please, you know, feel free to come off mute. Um, to, you know, uh, take advantage of the the knowledge and the expertise we have on the call uh, while it's in, while the opportunity is there. Um... To tap into Jan's comment, um, it is fairly specialized, and I will highly encourage you to work with a sustainability manager. So, if you're thinking to implement it in your own organization, get expertise that has invested and has the focus um, on the matter. There is an expertise that we should be supporting. Um, don't just try to do it all yourself. And if you are in a, a consulting sort of uh, hat, um, so please do work with a sustainability manager. Get somebody from the client's perspective um, to, to help because, um, yeah, it is specialized. And as technologies, we can do a lot of different things. Um, but you want somebody that knows the latest in terms of policies or how, when you may want to override certain of the scopes that um, the calculation sort of uh, does for you out of the box. And there are exceptions. And um, France is sort of dealing, uh, leading along the way as well with um, how your account for uh, employee commuting and other things. So do get the insider. It will help you to get there faster. Um, so just wanted to say once again, massive thank you, um, Ines and Carl, for uh, sharing your, your knowledge, your insights and expertise with us. It's been absolutely fascinating. Um, thank you to everyone else who has joined us. Um, it's great to see you all. Um, uh, for those who are based in London, um, we will be having, uh, well, we'll hopefully be having, uh, celebrating our fifth, our community's fifth birthday at our next event. So, um, yeah, we'll look forward to that. And yes, there will be cake uh, for those who can make it. Um, <laughs> for those who, uh, for those who are joining us from overseas, I'm sorry we can't share. Yeah, we won't be able to share this with you in person. But uh, uh, we hope to catch up with you at uh, sort of Salesforce events uh, and things that uh, yeah, happen frequently throughout the year. Um, 
But uh, but yeah, apart from that, I would love to just yeah, like to say thanks again to everyone. Um, and yeah, obviously a nice round of applause for our two brilliant speakers tonight. Thank you very much indeed.